Good morning, everybody. I'm saying morning because I'm on the Northern Hemisphere as we speak this morning. So it's morning to me, but I know down South in Africa, it's afternoon. So good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this webinar. I'm so excited. It's our first webinar as the Interprofessional Education and Collaborative Practice Technical Working Group of AfriHealth to host. It's been a long time coming. And I want to really say thank you to Ian Cooper, Chris Maltz, Chris Maltz, and Yena Mula for really taking the time and benefiting us with their knowledge and experience on interprofessional education and collaborative practice. And so this afternoon, we are going to talk about can interprofessional education make a difference to patient care? <clears throat> and we're saying that <clears throat> IPE or interprofessional education is widely recommended as an essential component of high quality professional education. I think all of you agree, especially having come out of the COVID pandemic and its lingering effects that we are still feeling up to now, it's important for us to begin to work collaboratively. As Africa, we face a lot of challenge from resource limitation, workforce shortages, burnout, uh, climate change that we are all seeing today, and so many other factors that um, we really need to embrace IPE, CP. And uh, the question, however, is does IPE lead to <clears throat> really a difference in patient care? And that's what we are going to discuss today. When we look at the hierarchies of the health education, for example, as I came out as nurses, we were sort of seen as nurses do this, doctors do this, and often the different professions don't talk to each other, don't even know what each other is doing. And so we want to say, does this collaboration really make a difference to patient care? Especially again, looking at the challenges we face in Africa, the contextual constraints that we face, we want to say and look at does team based care actually improve patient outcomes? How then can we move towards making this a reality? And so this webinar is going to explore all these different issues. Welcome all of you. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. We have three fantastic speakers this afternoon. Our first speaker is Chris Small, Chris Smalls, and he's going to talk about why interprofessional education is essential for workforce in Africa. And Chris Small comes from the Northwest University of South Africa. Our second speaker will be Yena Muller, and she's going to talk about does IPE translate into CP? And Yena is from Stellenbosch University. And last but not least, we have Ian Cooper, who is going to talk about how can IPE support teamwork in Africa? Uh, Dr. Ian Cooper is from Stellenbosch University as well. And then after the three speakers do give their presentations, we will then move to a discussion and question and answer from the audience. Welcome everybody. Over to you, Chris Mo. Um, Judy, and uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity to be part of this um, presentation. Um, IP is quite very critical on the continent, and so um, it gives me so much pleasure to be part of this um, group of people that are having this discussion today. Um, without much ado, I will also want to go quickly into the presentation or to um, waste much of the time. So um, my duty is to have a discussion around why interprofessional education is essential for health workforce in Africa. My presentation is going to reflect on the health labor market dynamics in Africa, then look at why IPE is essential, and then also to discuss the state of IPE on the continent. So if we have a look at this diagram, which deals with the health labor market um, analysis across um, the world, and this has been designed for um, such purpose and have really been taken into action in Africa, you will realize that the area that I have highlighted deals with the education sector. Now here, everything that has to do with 
the structure and the materials needed for training, the kind of people we train, um, what programs and what kind of staff do we have to train them, um, deals with the education component. Remember that this portion also deals with educating in other fields. So as, as aside training health professionals, we also train other people like the engineers and co that work within the health system. Don't also forget um, the highlight on where these people that we train are coming from the high schools. Now, these people are trained into a very bigger pool of health professionals that are either recruited into the health system to provide health care. Some who even decide not to work at uh, one point or the other. Some will travel abroad. Others um, will prefer to work in other sectors. For example, you will see um, nurses, medical doctors consulting for medical schemes and also other um, sectors which are not health related. So why is this important? Because the kind of people we train into these health systems um, affect even our lives and also the lives of the population that we take our pledges to serve. So in the health labor market, it is whatsoever is available that is recruited into the health system. And therefore, all the health services that we provide depend on the people because the health professionals form the bigger portion of the healthcare expenditure in every country. So if we recruit these people, the kind of people we recruit and then the kind of people that provide services for us will intricately be linked to the kind of health outcomes that we receive. I will move from here to my next slide where I want to have a quick look at a life, um, real life story of a client um, in one of the African countries. So this client um, sent the wife to the hospital for a typical surgery. Um, long and short is that the wife passed away due to medical negligence and also poor teamwork. Now, in the long write-up that he provided, he stated that, I can't believe you have done this again. Now, this is him writing about a doctor who was calling another doctor who was off duty, telling him that I can't believe you have done this again. This is the second time, uh, the second time. This woman's case is similar to the other one, but you have done it again. Folks, he says, at this point, I started feeling very cold. He was talking about the doctor who is at the point on duty, calling another doctor who was on duty, telling him that he had done something again. What did he do? This doctor prescribed a very wrong medication for the wife who um, just had surgery. And then the nurses also administered that medication without even checking or knowing what kind of medication and why it was prescribed. And uh, after that, when the other doctor came, pick it up and called him and was questioning him on the phone, um, this guy said that the reason why he wrote the story was that as the doctor was scolding the other doctor, the nurses were laughing heartily. Even the doctor was scolding his colleague jokingly. Yes, my wife lay dying and the nurses were laughing that a doctor had apparently prescribed the wrong medication for her. Now, this story tells um, a very short description of what happens in African health systems. So the nurses are so happy that a doctor had made a mistake because in, in, in many instances, it has always been, oh, is the nurse that have done this wrong and the doctor is scolding the nurse. So they feel happy if a doctor makes mistakes, which shouldn't be the case. And so if there is teamwork, it means it's the team that had committed this error. And so the team takes responsibility, but it's like trying to look for someone to blame you've done this and that. Why are we in this situation? This is why we are looking at the importance of interprofessional education on the African continent. So I'll, I'll move quickly to the indicators of the need for IP on the continent. The first one I'll talk about is the quality of the health workforce produced. Currently, we said that there's about 2.4 million 
health workers that are needed to reach universal health coverage in Africa. Aside the number that is needed, the one that we are even producing, what is the quality of those numbers that, that, that we have? There are many studies that have cautioned the quality of the, the products that we send into the health system. Um, that also not uh, withstanding, the number that we even sent into the system that we have calculated a shortage out of those numbers. There are many of them that are unemployed, even though there is shortage in the health system. So although we have the overall shortage, which means we are not producing as much as we need, there are also those that we produce that are not recruited because governments don't have the money to recruit these people. And so there is now, like we can call it an acute shortage. Now, aside this acute shortage, you can hear from many countries that there is an increasing migration of experienced health workforce. So when recruitment agents come from the Western world to recruit, they will not recruit those who, are, who have just completed school. So they look for the specialists, the pediatric nurses, they look at the, the, the specialist doctors, the special, every kind of health workforce that they need, they will look for those who have been trained long ago, those who have retrained themselves as specialists and those who have even gained a lot of years of experience. So even though we, those who are not employed, we say they can't be exported or even take jobs elsewhere, the recruitment agents are not looking for those ones. They are looking for the ones that are really holding the health systems intact in Africa. A short story about a friend who went to the UK and then applied for a job and they asked him to produce um, his pay slip of what he used to get. When he mentioned the money, they asked him, no, we, we mean your salary. He said, yeah, they said, no, we mean your salary. Well, what eventually was happening is that this guy's salary is so minute compared to what is paid an entry level nurse in the UK to the extent that the people who were on the committee recruiting do not believe that this was a salary. So it was kind of a joke that he was cracking. So there is that kind of demotivation. If you look at what you are paid and what someone is receiving as well, you feel like, why am I wasting my time doing this work? And then the government are not producing enough environment that will that support the work of these health professionals. There is this hierarchical workforce and the deepening turf war among health workers. Currently, you will find the advanced practice nurses having some issues with the general practitioners about who can prescribe and what you can prescribe. There is also this fight over the medical laboratories where the medical doctors who had had an extra training and specialized in um, other forms of pathology and staff want to head the medical laboratories and then the medical laboratory technologies and also scientists who some of them are now having um, doctoral degrees also believe that they have to head this laboratory. So there is always this kind of turf war which um, creates this kind of separation of um, health professionals into their different categories and also preventing teamwork. Now, we also see that there is a growing fear of the African health system due to medical errors as I presented earlier. Now, a lot of people even present, uh, prefer to send their wives and children up and also um, they themselves prefer to seek health care elsewhere than in the African health system. You could see our presidents, ministers, and who don't even go to the hospitals that they are supposed to get working. So there is this kind of fear among the people about whether I will survive or will I get out of this hospital safe if I go there and stuff like that. There is also the continuous uh, siloed kind of training of um, health professionals. It used to be like that. And we are saying that, can we come together? But it's like, because of all these issues that I, I mentioned in terms of the hierarchy and stuff, the professions are not willing and pushing to um, get their training together. There is increasing waste in the health system. Now, the waste is also very essential because 
Um, the last systematic review that we did for the WHO, we have presented this in one of the conferences, so um, I would like to share it, shows that about 77% of the health systems are efficient. What it means is that if you put a hundred dollar into the health system, only $77 will be used for the purpose for which it has been apportioned. So about 33% of that will go waste on the average in the Africa health system. We have actually mapped out um, which countries have the difficulties in terms of the heavily inefficient systems. Now, efficiency becomes an issue when people are not working together. So they waste resources because um, health worker A will do something and then B is not aware, will do a similar thing or um, a, a kind of an alternate of that same issue. So before you realize, you waste the system resources. So we will always be complaining about, we don't have resources, we don't have resources, but then it's not always about not having, it's always about making the best out of what we have um, currently. Now, the state of IP on the, and then a scholarship of IP on the continent. We can see that there is a growing number of IP programs. I was so amazed when I came to the Afri Health Conference. There are many of the programs that I wasn't even aware of in the literature that people presented from the University of Zambia and, and other institutions. There are many of our uh, uh, um, scholars that are also writing quite uh, very good papers uh, um, on IP on the continent. We also have the African, which is pushing the, 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 the stake of IP on the continent and helping other institutions to um, develop their programs. Um, as you could see, there are studies ongoing I know that the University of Western uh, Cape has an IP, strong IP uh, program there. The Northwest University, um, a study had yet been concluded where the IP program has been developed for the faculty. And this program is even being piloted in two other countries, Malawi and Ghana, for um, other two faculties that are um, in need of IP programs. I know about the Stellenbosch University that has IP program and many other institutions across the continent that are pushing for IP. So yes, we are doing something about the issue and writing about it. Others are learning from those experiences that uh, other colleagues are writing about. I also got into the IP space about three years ago. Um, currently, I have five papers under review uh, in different journals and also different study sites that are working on IP across um, the continent. So there is quite a lot of work being done. There is even a postgraduate diploma in interprofessional education in one of our institutions in Africa. So it tells you that we are pushing for these IP programs to have grounding on the continent. But the big issue we want to ask ourselves is the next question is that, why is this IP program that we are pushing and trying to develop and helping one institution from the other to have their IP program developed and implemented? Are they really having effect on the ground? So that is what Ian will be um, looking at. Um, I want to thank you for your audience. And these are some of the um, sources that I use for this presentation. Thank you very much, Judy. Thank you, Chris. Well, I think I'm just going to go straight ahead into the next presentation. So I'll be looking at whether or not IPE translates into collaborative practice. So per definition, and according to the literature, that's the exact purpose of IPE, um, that interprofessional education is its very purpose is to result in collaborative patient care. And um, Interprofessional collaborative practice is defined as a group of professionals who are effective at working together with learners, practitioners, patients, clients, families, and the communities to enable optimal health outcomes. And this includes elements of respect, trust, shared decision making, and partnerships. If you look to the right, these are the competencies that 
that graduates and clinicians need to have in order to collaborate interprofessionally. They need to be able to bring the patient in as part of the family, as part of the, the patient's team. Um, they need to be able to share responsibility and accountability for the team to function. There needs to be role clarification. Collaborative leadership has to be possible. There needs to be transparency and an ability to resolve interprofessional conflict. And there needs to be dynamic interprofessional communication. Interprofessional collaboration is not referring to somebody or instructing someone to do something. It's also not listening to a consultant or a health professional in a ward round. It's also not telling a family what they should do, nor is it a group of multi-professionals working alongside one another and not communicating. So Reeves just sort of explores the notion of teamwork as not being a singular phenomenon. So when we think about teamwork as collaborative teamwork, teamwork is linear, it's progressive. There's multiple stages of teamwork that eventually do result in collaborative practice. And I think this is often we think we have to be collaborative in the way we work, but there is actually a linear progression that has to happen. You start off with your interprofessional networking, people knowing of one another, which speaks to the definition of IPE, which is people learning about, learning from and learning with other people. So having a network of interprofessional um, professions allows you to learn about others. Having interprofessional coordination where there's communication between team members allows you to learn from different professionals. Interprofessional teamwork allows you to learn with other professions. All of these theoretically resulting in interprofessional collaborative practice. So being able to learn with, from and about each other is necessary for collaborative practice to happen. One needs to recognize one's own limitations, understand the value of other professions, be able to communicate with them around specific needs, also to be able to extend your communication outside of the healthcare team and to identify specific goals that the team can work towards. Like Chris Moore was saying, the reason why we do this is actually to re reduce the prevalence of burnout, to reduce readmissions, to save on healthcare expenditure. It results in better discharge planning. The evidence is very clear. It helps root, it helps identify the root cause of problems and improve patient outcomes. But does it translate into collaborative practice? So there's scant literature that actually shows that um, interprofessional education results in interprofessional collaboration after graduation. And the reason for this is that it requires a longitudinal approach to research. And many of the studies that have been conducted have been looking specifically at self-reported um, self -reported, um, competency developments from professionals in the workplace and self-reported changes in behavior. So not necessarily observational studies where it's possible to see if graduates are in fact working collaboratively. There is evidence to show that even though students are exposed to interprofessional education um, in undergrad, they do have a better sense of what teamwork is after graduation. They also have a better appreciation for the value of collaborative practice, and they're able to work more reflexively. So there's definitely a benefit, even if there isn't a direct translation to collaborative practice. But there's a number of articles that show us that interprofessional collaborative practice is indeed actually happening in certain clinical contents context, regardless of interprofessional education. Um, and these are generally organizational structures that are well functioning, which Ian will talk to a little bit later. But one of the main reasons that interprofessional education is not resulting, or there isn't enough evidence to show that it's not resulting in interprofessional collaboration, is not just the challenge of the study that's required, but also because of the nature of the working environments. So specific to Africa, we've got evidence, good evidence, thanks to our interprofessional colleagues, some of them who are already online from AfriPen, who've done great literature, looking at the changes in perceptions and beliefs of undergraduate students, changes in the behavior of the, of, um, the students in the clinical setting, and also a change in intent to practice interprofessionally after interprofessional education at an undergraduate level. Doing interprofessional education in the healthcare context for undergraduates actually is also shown to change practice and culture in the African context, as well as improve patient satisfaction. So all in all, IPE is an absolute go. But what about interprofessional collaboration? So 
the studies that have been done show that collaboration isn't really clearly understood and it's not always um, observed as an obtainable objective. There's a feeling that there's not enough opportunity to build relationships and the graduates enthusiasm who have been through interprofessional education often wanes um, due to a drop in confidence when they enter the workplace. And this is due to the challenges that Wagi et al actually um, define quite well. Issues that Chris Mill actually pro proposed to us as reasons for IPE are the very issues in Africa that are also limiting the conversion of IPE into collaborative practice. Issues of hierarchy, high patient turnover, referral processes, lack of knowledge of roles and scope of practice, sometimes negative attitudes and communication inefficiencies, the geographic layout of the hospitals and clinics, logistics, and also again the silo approach to care. So the what type of interprofessional education is actually shown to work for graduates? Practical, workplace-based, something that's reinforced by management, which allows for a shift in culture in the workplace, something that allows for relationship development that's patient-centered. And there's good evidence to support the use of a, a tool or framework to help students and professionals develop the competencies they need to work collaboratively. By using a tool or framework, I mean having a common language or a common communication tool. This has been shown uh, in this particular case, we've used the ICF, the International Classification for Function, Disability and Health, which is actually being used by a number of um, researchers and educationalists in Africa. And it's definitely been shown to promote interprofessional collaborative practice in students, but it's also been shown to change the practices of clinical staff who work with those students in the in district hospital setting. And also the ICF in itself has been shown to promote interprofessional collaboration in the professional practice of clinicians, specifically in Rwanda. That is an excellent thesis to go and find, Sagahatu. So basically what we need is we have to understand the influencing factors. What is it about where we're working that's not allowing for IPCV to take place, interprofessional collaboration to take place? And then link identified problems with recommended solutions because the, the magic really lies in our hands. Ian will talk to us a little bit more about the nuances of organizational change, um, but I, I'm looking forward to the discussion and questions afterwards. Thank you. Thank you, Jana. Good afternoon, everybody, and it's a pleasure to be with you this afternoon and to have the chance to uh, finish off the uh, input uh, amongst the three of us this afternoon. And thank you, Jana and Chris Mal for uh, leading the way uh, in terms of that. So how can we support, how can IPE support teamwork in Africa? So there we go. So we've agreed that team-based care is vital to improving patient outcomes wherever you are, of course, in Africa. Chris Mal has talked about the importance of IPE to ensure that we have workforce, that we are developing healthcare teams, um, noting that uh, what interprofessional education is in that context. But we can't assume that IPE will translate into collaborative practice that's required for team-based care. And that's really the focus of what Jana um, was, was talking about. Um, and uh, we have published on, on that issue and the limitations of healthcare environments. Um, Reeves, uh, from another paper to the one that, that uh, Jana quoted, um, spoke about the general philosophical consensus that there is about interprofessional collaboration, but actually, in reality, uh, institutional structures are challenging that. Um, and beyond just getting the relationships right, one of those uh, elements of collaborative care that uh, Jana spoke about um, it's difficult to see how we're going to change structures, legal, political, and economic structures, um, and how we uh, actually address the gap between IPE and collaborative care, and in fact, uh, patient care. And really, a lot of this is about a matter of perspective. Um, and we saw that through the 
and I continue to see in terms of the Black Lives Matter movement, um, that people react to that because they have a different perspective or understand differently. And it is understanding the perspective that that comes from, that it's not saying that all lives don't matter, but there needs to be a particular focus on Black Lives for particular uh, reasons in a particular context. It is exactly the same thing in terms of achieving uh, proper collaboration in uh, interprofessional teams. And why is that? If you look at how doctors compared to others view teams, you'll see there's a major problem. So in research done by, by Lingard and others, they, they showed that the in actual, the enactment of collaborative leadership was a challenge. So you have physicians, doctors who are saying their teams are non-hierarchical, but everybody else in the team is saying, uh-uh, it's hierarchical and the doctor's boss. So there's a complete disjuncture between what the doctors think is going on and what the rest of the team is going on. And there are a number of other studies have shown that same kind of uh, disjuncture. And without addressing the matter of perspective, we are not going to address the way that teams work together. So we actually need to be real and, and, and really say what is going on. And there's an excellent um, article by Hadara and Lingard, which did a, a literature review looking at interprofessional collaboration, uh, discourse analysis, and actually look and said across the literature, there are two approaches, a utilitarian and an emancipatory approach. The utilitarian approach really links to the question we've asked, and it's saying it's positivist, it's experimental, it's saying does IPE improve patient care, and if so, what are the best outcomes? And it looks at, at evidence and quantitative, et cetera. But there's another whole section of articles in literature that is emancipatory because it looks at what are the power relations, what is going on in terms of of power and how do we address those issues um, in order to make a difference? So we need to be asking in that uh, somebody needs to be muted. Um, we ask in uh, Roger, if you can just uh, mute that, that person, thank you. Um, are we asking the right question when we focus on the difference IPES to make or, or are there actually other questions that we need to be asking in order to influence patient care? questions that relate to power. And the problem is, and this is why I connected it to Black Lives Matter, dominant groups do not perceive their values in everyday clinical practice as culturally produced. And it's assumed the minorities or other groups. So you'll hear doctors talk about nursing culture without recognizing there's a medical culture that they are part of, or whatever the case may be in terms of the groups. And it's challenging for members of dominant groups to engage reflexively with the values and beliefs of others because they actually don't see that they have uh, their own set of values and beliefs. So they universalize their values and beliefs. And, and we see that so many times in terms of different uh, interactions across different dynamics. Um, and so those power relations that actually shape the privilege um, of these interpretations go unnoticed in the process. How do clinicians exercise power? Um, there are two ways of exercising power. There's a competitive power, and uh, Chris Small has spoken a bit about that in terms of the example, that domination and the need for competition. Or there's a collaborative power where there's interdependent participation and decision making. And both forms exist in health services. And too often in Africa, we have a situation of competitive power that is dominating the way that we work and unfortunately, patient management is the key site where, or the key place where negotiation about clinical roles happens and where these power issues, domination, competitive or collaborative power actually is, is happened in terms of the decision-making, the input into care, what you talk about in terms of care and how you evaluate care. We recognize, of course, that clinical work is complex, but that complexity is within social relational issues. And we can't ignore the social relationship issues. We can't just say this is about the patient and how we treat the patient. Because even with the patient, there's a relationship. It's a, it's a social relation, relational issue. 
So to prepare trainees to navigate this complexity requires that we acknowledge the professional identity and the current professional identity of physician knows best is obsolete in a healthcare la landscape that really requires multiple forms of expertise and whether interdependence is necessary. And yet that professional identity often persists and is still quite strongly there in, in many of our health contexts at the moment. How do we address this gap? There are huge lessons in terms of safety in healthcare that we can learn from the aviation industry, how they deal with near misses, how they uh, achieve safety um, and ensure that they prevent and deal with mistakes. But one of the key areas that I think we can learn from in terms of interprofessional care from the airline industry is how they deal with hierarchy. And they've actually addressed that very strong, strongly because they've recognized that if the pilot is seen as boss and nobody challenges them when they make a mistake, that causes planes to crash, that causes many people to die. And you have to deal with that in order to make it safer. And so there's a very interesting paper from the, the British Journal of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery um, where they talk about how they could bring in the lessons from airline pilots to address the hierarchical gradients between healthcare professions and specialties and, and different uh, professions. And they talk about the importance of a regular team brief, which is what happens in the uh, airline sector. Crews have regular team briefs. And the particular phrase that anyone can and should speak up if you have any concerns, whatever, without fear of retribution. In other words, empowering people to speak up regardless of, of hierarchy. Um, and actually, they talk about how uh, we can choose to be passive or aggressive in the way that we respond. But actually, what we, we need to be is we need to be assertive. We need to be able to express our mind, express our opinion without having to be uh, aggressive and certainly not uh, with withholding back in terms of uh, what we say. And so they've ad ad adopted certain tools from the airline industry in terms of how one can address it. So there's steps, and I'm not going to go into all the details there, but there's steps of how you raise an issue. Um, you, you, you probe and then you alert and you challenge and then you say there's emergency and you actually intervene at that point. And it's actually helping and the team talks through that. So the pilot knows that every member of the crew could be doing this and they actually feel safer because they know that the crew's got their back, even though having their back might mean intervening to stop them doing something wrong in certain places. So how can we, how can IPE support teamwork in Africa? At both an academic and clinical level, in our clinical and academic environments, we need to ad address hierarchy. Um, it's not saying that physician leadership is, uh, is problematic in and of itself. It's just the issues need to be raised. We need to acknowledge and confront the challenges so that it enables interprofessional teams to address the issues and improve their collaborative practice. And to say that doesn't mean necessarily a physician has to be the team leader, but this needs to be discussed and worked out. We also need to acknowledge the perspectives I'm, I, I talked about earlier, that we have different views of the world and different ways of doing things and bring them out into the open and enable an emancipatory discourse that actually addresses hierarchy. Uh, and lastly, in addition to the things that, and, and Jana has mentioned this already, but that we place IPE in real world contexts, not in classrooms, so that uh, our students can transition uh, into that. And so really it's about addressing the elephant in the room when we are uh, doing IPE and making sure we're addressing these issues as part of the educational space. Thank you. Really great presentations, Ian, Yena, and Chris Moll. I want to thank you so much. Um, and uh, at this point, we are about 20 minutes to go to the end of the webinar. I want to open it out for discussions, uh, questions to the fantastic presenters we've had this afternoon. Uh, you can put it in the chat. You can unmute yourself and speak. This is the time. Maybe I'll set the ball rolling um, and ask you, Ian, um, 
very quickly, Ian, um, I really like the way you sort of um, given us an analogy of the pilots and the probe that, you know, the, the acronym. Where do you think in Africa we can start or how can we start to do this? Because I think that's where the, 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 the challenge is. So maybe I can be a nurse as a nurse in my role and I have a patient and um, I'm doing whatever I do as a nurse. Maybe, um, um, what can I say, inserting an NG tube. So that's my work as a nurse and that's what the patient needs. And then I realize something. Where do you think we need to start so that these things you're saying become part and parcel of our culture? Is it at the point of education? If we didn't get it in our education, how do we get to do it in practice? Is it in research? What are your thoughts around actually inculcating this sense of collaboration in a very meaningful way, particularly for us here in Africa? Over. That's a big question, Judy, but I think it's, it's, it's both and, it's not either or. Um, um, and what I mean by both and, it's both on the service side and on the education side. And, and yes, obviously research backs that up. But I mean, I think that from the, from the education side, as I was mentioning, to do, uh, to do classroom based IPE is, is limited. We actually need to be in that difficult clinical context. We need to have students with us and be debating and talking about and, and, and looking at that. And I mean, obviously one can do scenarios, when I mean the classroom, also scenarios where one has real life scenarios is also a, a way to be doing it. But, but to be addressing those specifically and, and say what went wrong and why did it go wrong and, and how could we do it differently? But at the clinical side, it is about leadership and about leadership of whoever is, uh, is, is, is leading the team, but actually it's, it's, it's about people taking the initiative to stand up and say, you know, we need to discuss these issues. Uh, this is not, instead of getting in, you know, in, into fights about who's wrong and what's wrong and saying, how can we actually work together? And certainly I've uh, had the privilege of working in a context where we had that kind of teamwork and we were able to sit and discuss things together. We were able to talk through patients and mistakes, and etc., and try and without blame to be saying, you know, who should be playing this role? Who should be doing this? How do we do this better? So uh, it's it's from both sides. But I mean, we have a hugely professional, I mean, hugely experienced uh, audience as well, who I'm sure could contribute to this discussion as well. Thanks, Ian. Her Herad, I see your hand up. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you to the um, excellent speakers this afternoon. I really like what Ian was saying in terms of, you know, we, we don't need IPE to happen in the classroom anymore. We actually need IPE to happen out in the field. Mm. And... Um, I think the challenge or something that's in the back of my mind is how do we address the um, the staff who has not been um, had the opportunity to engage in IPE as part of their education? Um, because I often find that we we send our students out into the field to work with health professionals who have to supervise them or clinicians, but they're not role modeling what we're expecting from the students because they've not been schooled in in ipe so how do we bridge that gap thank you thanks gerard and lovely to see you this afternoon let me take a couple of questions and then we'll go over to the speakers nada fadu good to see you again Yes, good to see everyone. Thank you so much. Uh, excellent presentations, really informative and highly, highly needed. So the question I have is that, you know, uh, we are now at a stage where this incoming generation understands the value of IPE. They need the tools on how to actually work collaboratively and how to see things from the other's perspective and how to empathize with each other in the role. The problem we find that the system sometimes do not allow that the policies at the higher level do not provide that safe environment for people to actually now go and point out that we need to have those discussions, we need to have these difficult conversations. So the system still creates this, even if it's not written, you know, there is this culture of hierarchy that some people are immune from 
criticism, etc. So I guess the question back to policy implementations, you know, what, what's the role there and what's been happening to enable these, uh, this change in culture to happen at the ground. And thank you so much again, excellent presentations. Thank you, Nada. Patricia? Uh, thank you, Judy, and um, uh, thank you, uh, Ian. I like the aspect of uh, professional identity uh, as having a window towards promoting uh, uh, IPC. And my, my question is, uh, how do we inculcate this aspect of professional identity? And specifically, how could we use it to promote uh, IPC? Because sometimes I feel probably how it's, uh, as an individual, if you don't identify yourself well, you may not be able to collaborate with others. So how can professional identity actually help us in inculcating or implementing uh, the collaborative practice? Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. Maybe I'll ask Yana to take a stab at um, answering some of those or responding to those comments, and then Chris Mal, and then Ian. Oh, thanks. Thanks. So those are very tough questions, and I think you know everybody's going to possibly have a different perspective. So I also want to encourage my colleagues online um, to contribute. But I think um, talking about the implementation of IPE in a context that or IPC in a context that's not ready for it. So if you're working with a hospital or a health service that is not conducive to collaboration, what should you do, especially if those people haven't had exposure to IPE? Um, I think it's really, again, about treating our clinicians the same way we would, in a sense, treat our students. Um, the same way I've learned about IPE as a clinician, I've learned through walking that road with my students. So enabling environments where there are opportunities for colleagues to learn with one another, from one another, and about one another, will in essence create relationships, which is also going to improve role identity and understanding of your limitations in your profession. So things that have been read, that I read in the literature were having um, CPD accredited discussions around different professional competencies or different professional roles, having a collaborative tool that you use to have a look at the patient comprehensively and what that does, I think, as well, is creates a very uncomfortable situation for any clinician when suddenly the patient presents with a, such a complex history and such a complex picture that they realize that they aren't able to address the patient's needs in, on their own. And that enables this opportunity for extending out to other professions to collaborate. So having CPD accredited ward rounds, being able to um, drive it from a policy policy area. So we've actually got the HPCSA that requires for us to work interprofessionally. So a lot of the recommendations are already out there. It's about getting management in a clinical setting to, to drive it. And I think what we might be lacking in Africa specifically is enough research to prove to policymakers and to medical managers that IPC reduces costs and reduces readmissions. Because once we can attach the cost benefit to interprofessional education and interprofessional collaboration, it will be much easier to introduce it into an environment where there is a, an issue with hierarchy. Um, there was another, the last question that was asked. I didn't have a chance to jot that down. Professional identity. identity. Yes, that's right. Yeah. So professional identity. I mean, I, again, I think making sure that everybody has a sense of their own professional identity and being having an opportunity to share that with their colleagues. Um, but more than professional identity is also understanding professional limitations. And um, there are a number of, of tools that are available that we can also make available to you in order to assess an individual's professional identity, in order to assess somebody's willingness to engage with other professions. So there are ways to, to try to capture that from team members to see where the need is and where people do need um, assistance in developing certain skills. I hope that helps answer some of the questions. Thank you so much, Yena. 
Prisma, your thoughts? Thank you, Judy. So um, I'll just make some general comments regarding the questions which are similar in nature. So if we look at having to get the IPC um, moving forward in Africa, um, Ian spoke, I mean, very well about having to push the training into the clinical setting. But we must also not, um, uh, how do we call it, ignore the fact that we are running short of clinical training sites. And so we are quite moving into simulation laboratories where we don't have um, those who are actually in real life practice uh, with us in the institutions. The greatest problems we have in Africa, actually we can also look at it in terms of community where most of our problems are community or primary healthcare um, base. And so, um, I know Ian and uh, his colleagues do quite a lot of work in the community with IPC. So I think we should also push more of the IPCP programs into community-based uh, care um, settings. Um, looking at the professional identity, I believe that most of us, I mean, health professionals, we know what we do as individual professionals. And uh, we already have inherited traditional belief systems regarding who is superior to who and who do you report to in terms of uh, even clinical administration, uh, who leads the, the clinical team, even if we have a team in any case, um, there had always been the medical doctor leading and everybody um, following as Ian will say, can we look at trying to shift roles within these um, clinical settings to see, okay, if the medical laboratory scientist is leading in maybe some of the areas of care. Because in the team, we expect that when it comes to the acute phases where we need to have diagnosis and uh, stuff like that, yes, it is good the medical doctor leads. But when the patient is on admission and is being taken care of, the next place much role than um, each other, uh, all other professions. So should we not have the next lead that session? And when it comes to um, the, the time when we are going to um, discharge, can we have the community uh, practitioners and co-lead that process because there will be issues of follow-up and stuff like that. But how do we do that? Looking at the traditional nature of our care systems, we must also not forget about the patriarchal cultural systems in, in Africa that puts uh, um, some of the gender ahead of others and you have to report to who and the dominant nature of the the, the, um, the, the female gender in medicine and the, um, how do we call it, the male in medicine. We need to look at all these things in general and see how do we go forward? Because this is a very um, a big professional group. I think that um, audience, you should also bring out your voice in terms of how do we go forward from here? How do we make sure we push the IP from the institutions into um, the workplace? Thank you very much. Great summary there, Chris Moll, and it segues very well into just um, what I'd like us to take just a few minutes as we close this webinar, and I'm very I'm happy that it's triggered a lot of thought. Uh, Ian and Yana and Chris Mal, thank you for those preparing those really uh, good presentations. I think we'll, we'll record this will certainly be recorded and put out there for all of us on the website. And I believe we can work to share all the presentations. I think, and this comes back to you, Georgina, as our executive director of Afri Health, that I think at this point we need to begin to think from what Chris Mal is saying how do we drive? some of these key issues forward sort of together um, as a continent i know countries like south africa a bit of uganda have done very well uh, in beginning to do ipe but many of the other countries are unfortunately quite quite uh, behind in this and um, i think our biomedical model doesn't help like chris mal is saying correctly the way we are socialized then the way we are trained and the the way we come out of our training and then the way we have continued to train does not 
really support the IPECP. And I think to me, AfriHealth now becomes the vehicle through which we can begin to break down these barriers that we've discussed. You know, like Nada is saying correctly from the policy side, uh, we can talk about the institutional side. So for me, I'm very keen to begin to see us learning together uh, coming out of the learning to then practice together, working in the community, changing some of these silly things that we have, like Chris Moll has alluded to where, you know, it, it's only a doctor who can sign for something so simple like crutches or assistive devices when we know that the physiotherapists and the occupational therapists are much more uh, qualified in that particular area and so on and so forth. So I think for me, what I'm, I, I, I'm saying is, coming out of this webinar and the thoughts that have been triggered, how do we use AfriHealth as a vehicle to move IPECP in Africa forward? Because at least here, we can all see we are coming from the different uh, countries. I've also seen the comments in the chat. Thank you very much. The resources are available. Um, the, the, the recording will be available. The PowerPoints will be available. And in addition, I think, you know, we have members of the IPE, CPTWG here, Patricia is here, Hawa is here, I think Francisca is here, and a number of you who are members of the IPCP. And I would like to encourage all of you to really join this um, technical working group because I think we can begin to intentionally now chip away and find solutions, intentional solutions to these um, issues that have come out this afternoon. Um, I'd like to give maybe one minute or two to, to Ian to just give us his uh, final remarks before we call it a day. Thanks, Judy. Um, yeah, I talked about the elephant in the room earlier. Um, you also all know that saying about how do you eat an elephant with one mouthful at a time and i think that's how we move forward but there's another part of how you eat an elephant how you eat an elephant is to invite a community to eat with you and i think in terms of addressing this i think there are two aspects one as chris Paul alluded to i think ip ecp works best at a community level uh, it's much more challenging at a big hospital level, although they're good examples in big hospitals as well in terms of teams, transplant teams or palliative care teams and so on. Um, but often when we're closer to the community, we, we realize how much we learn from each other. And I think what we mustn't forget in this, um, and I've been challenged about this with an international visitor we've had from Brazil in the last few days, of the role patients play as well. And they're actually also part of the team and remembering that 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 they uh, can help us a huge amount if we uh, are ready to listen to them and and um, learn from what they know and not thinking that we know everything. And I think that's the start of the problems in in collaboration is, is all of us thinking that 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 we know more than others, be it colleagues or patients and and that that humility. But the other aspect of of communities, not just working with, but I think as us as a community of practice across every health, across um, our different uh, groups uh, of us working, as uh, Judy was saying, the challenge to Afri Health is how, as a community, do we change what is happening? Uh, and I think with our role as Afri Health in terms of education and health, we can actually lead change, and we need to be addressing this specifically. It's something that Afri Health should be championing because it is a critical issue that is not being sufficiently dressed in, in Africa. Thank you, Judy. I want to say thank you so much to all of you. And I've actually been watching the, the Zoom chat to see uh, not a single one of the participants dropped off from the time we started one hour ago to now. We were 38 and we are still 38 at the top of the hour. And that's really just a testament to to really you, Ian and Yana and Chrisma, for, for, for your thoughts and insights and giving us the benefit of your knowledge and experience. And uh, I'm really grateful to you for that. I'm grateful to all of you participants. Like I said, please plug into AfriHealth and begin to see where you can help. Because again, like Ian says, we eat the elephant as a community, but the only way to eat it is to actually cut the piece and put it in your mouth. So it means each one of us 
has to do something ourselves to, to eat that elephant. It, it can't be fed to you. So I'd really encourage all of you. I'm very excited to see participants from across the different countries, new faces that haven't been there. Nada, I met you in, um, in Harare and it's really great to have you plug in. I think you bring a wealth of expertise and experience that we need from your own uh, country and, and, and that's needed to benefit um, Afri Health. And so many of you, even from outside Africa, Deborah, welcome uh, to this and thank you for being with us. Um, I see you, Jackie Cooper, you're always so supportive of us. It's really great to have you, Lufuno. All of you really, I'm so grateful to all of you. Funmi, Abigail, um, Pilo, Janet, Yasmin, um, really, a Caleb, it's lovely to have you, Maita Beleng, on the call this afternoon. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Plug into Afri Health. Have a good rest of your day and make sure you watch that space. We will have lots and lots coming to you from the IPECP space. But remember, like Ian says, we have to eat the elephant together. Well done. Thank you very much, everybody. Please fill in the evaluation form before we leave. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. 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 Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you, Judith. Well done, Hope. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Community man. Bye bye.